Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first in a series of programs here at the Hall of Fame that we call Virtual Voices of the Game, where we talk to baseball experts, writers, historians, iconic figures within the game. And we're very glad to have joining us today our first guest, a longtime uh, baseball writer and historian, a one-time presidential speechwriter, Kurt Smith. Uh, we do first welcome everybody uh, joining us uh, today uh, for this program. Thank you very much for being with us. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Bruce Marcus, and I work in the Education Department at the Hall of Fame. And we're broadcasting just outside of Cooperstown. Our museum is currently closed, though we're hoping that will change in the not too uh, distant future. Very glad to have with us for our first ever virtual voices of the game, um, someone who's been a, a friend of mine for a long time, a friend of the Hall of Fames for an even longer time, and his name is Kurt Smith. Kurt has written 17 books, including The Presidents and the Pastime, his most recent book, which came out two years ago. It explores the history of baseball and the White House, but he's also done many other things too. He was the one-time speechwriter for President George H.W. Bush back in the 1980s and 90s. And he's also a member of the Hall of Fame's Ford C. Frick Committee, which helps um, announce the winner of the Ford C. Frick Award each year. Joining us today, Kurt Smith. Kurt, thank you for being with us. Always a pleasure. How are you holding up under the current situation? Well, uh, uh, Bruce, I think I'm holding up fairly well. Uh, my students at the University of Rochester who are taking my courses, you'll have to ask them how they are holding up yeah. under uh, my tutelage in presidential uh, rhetoric and also public speaking. But uh, this is a brave new world or an unbrave new world, uh, depending on how uh, proficient I think we are with the technology. Uh, Zoom was a word that uh, uh, I knew only in, in watching the Honeymooners reruns when I was a kid when Ralph Cramden would, uh, would uh, unfurl his fist and say to, to, uh, to wife Alice, Alice, Bang, boom, zoom, you're going to the moon. And now it has an entirely new uh, definition for me. So I'm muddling through and uh, enjoying the students perhaps a bit more than, uh, than the technology. But uh, I think all of us could hope that this is a uh, once only in a lifetime experience. Yeah. For me, the word zoom brings to mind a 1970s television show. It was a kid show, as I recall, on PBS. Do you remember that? No, I don't. No? I don't. Okay. And I'll take your word. Uh, it's always been good with me, and I know it is here as well. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I used to watch it in the afternoons occasionally after school, uh, way back uh, many, many years ago. Um, Kurt, we're going to talk about a number of topics today. First of all, though, we want to really address the subject of real-world events and how they have affected baseball from time to time. We see it in 2020 with the coronavirus, which has delayed the start of the baseball season, has put into question the possibility of there being a season. I'm, I guess, an optimist by nature, and I, I'm still hopeful uh, that the season will take place, but we just we don't know for sure at this point in time. But there is some historical precedent uh, for this. I'm going to go back to the World War I years. America yeah. became involved in World War I, April 6, 1917, and the involvement continued through November of 1918. Now for the 1918 season, the two leagues, the American and National League, they decided going into the season, we're gonna reduce the number of games from 154 to 140 because of what was going on with World War II. Right. And then as the season progressed, they actually shortened the season even more. They actually went down to 100, uh, under 130 games, played the World yes. Series very early in September. Take us back to that, Kurt. Um, was this strictly because of World War I, or was the worldwide influenza also a factor in shortening the 1918 season? Well, the answer is uh, yes to, uh, to each of the above. Uh, baseball's involvement, as America's involvement was, was uh, rather uh, convoluted in terms of, a, of the First World War. Woodrow Wilson was president. The war itself began in Europe in, uh, in uh, 1914. 
but America, uh, isolationist as we always have been, uh, we fight only when we have to, not because we want to. Um, we became involved in 1917, and uh, we had 378,000 troops um, when the war began, when our involvement in the war began. We wound up in uh, late 1918 with 4.7 million troops. And baseball um, really had very little leadership during the war. Um, it's often had very little leadership, at least of an inspired bent, but it didn't have a commissioner. Kennesaw Mountain Landis, of course, was the first commissioner, and he was appointed in the wake of the uh, Black Sox scandal in 1920. So what you've got in, in, in 1920 is an American League president, Ban Johnson, and a National League president, John Tenor, and they can't decide whether baseball is essential or not. They've got a lot of company. Uh, the uh, war board uh, had a criteria, and that is that if you were essential, uh, you, you didn't necessarily have to send troops abroad. If you were in, a, in an enterprising uh, vocation such as uh, uh, Broadway plays, they were deemed essential. But they decided that baseball was deemed not essential. And so, uh, for some unbeknownst reason, and so the whole concept, I've got the note dotted down here, of work or fight. And that is if you were in an enterprise where, um, where you were, were deemed not essential, you fought, you went to Europe. And if you were deemed uh, essential, you worked here in the States. Mm -hmm. And so uh, quite a few of America's uh, baseball players went abroad not as many as during the Second World War, but a goodly number. Others uh, stayed here and tried to find a, a domestic job. Baseball owners were just as divided. They didn't know whether they should, they should uh, uh, keep the number at 140 games, as you suggest, they had, they had agreed upon this at the beginning of the year, or whether they should have a further uh, diminution. And they finally decided that the uh, season should end literally on the 1st of September which is a stunning date to any of us prior, I guess, to this year. Uh, they finally decided on uh, September 1st, uh, which was uh, uh, a further diminution for the simple reason the owners liked that, because that meant that they didn't have to play the, pay the players for the extra month of, of September. Uh, mm -hmm. Unlike today, where, where uh, players without exception have their contract uh, set before the season for the entire season. Some players back in 1917, 1918 were actually paid month by month. So the, so the owners didn't have to pay the players for the extra month of September. So in any event, uh, the season ended on September 1st. And in the star spangled uh, banner year in which America became involved in the war to a, uh, to a fair thee well, and really were, was decisive in ending the war and winning the war for the Allies, uh, those two national teams, the Chicago Cubs and the Boston Red Sox became involved in the World Series. And the Red Sox won the series in six games. The Sox played their games at Fenway Park, although prior uh, series they played them at Braves Field, which had a larger seating capacity. The Cubs did not play their games at Wrigley Field. They played them at larger Comiskey Park. So on September 5, the uh, series began, and it went six games, and the, and the Red Sox won. Their last World Series, of course, as we all know, I particularly being a Red Sox fan, and many of your, and many of your participants are perhaps too, their last World Series for uh, how many years now? For 86 years. And uh, uh, the first game was September 5. Babe Ruth was the starting pitcher and the winning pitcher for the Red Sox, the final score, one to nothing. And the, uh, and the uh, patriotic uh, climax came in the seventh inning, during the seventh inning stretch. The Star Spangled Banner was not played on a regular basis for any baseball game or regular sports event at that time. But in the seventh inning, the U.S. Navy Band began playing the Star Spangled Banner. The crowd stood up, and as the... Uh, as the uh, uh, Song was being played. Fred Thomas, a Red Sox uh, third baseman who had been furloughed by the Navy, 
so that he could play in the World Series for Boston, did his military salute to the uh, American flag. Mm -hmm. At the conclusion of the uh, Star Spangled Banner, the crowd erupted with a resounding mm -hmm. uh, applause. And as the New York Times said, um, during the next five games, which uh, in which the uh, Star Spangled Banner was uh, similarly played, the crescendo of applause uh, rose uh, exponentially. And so from then on, at special occasions, over the next, what was it, 13 years, the Star Spangled Banner was, uh, was played at, uh, at sporadic major events. And then in 1931, mm. President Hoover, one of the greatest baseball fans ever to be president, uh, deemed that the Star Spangled Banner would officially become uh, America's national anthem. And so, uh, although uh, uh, 675,000 Americans were killed uh, during uh, uh, the pandemic, which certainly was a reason that, uh, that American uh, uh, baseball climax, rather, uh, and shortened uh, its season in 1918, and 195,000 uh, Americans died in October of 1918 alone. Neither World War I nor the pandemic alone was responsible for shortening the season. Both factors were. As you say, um, many of the American deaths as a result of the so-called Spanish flu coming after the shortening of the season. October. Yes, in fact, yes, in fact, they did. Uh, the uh, uh, a, a lot of the um, uh, deaths that were caused in America um, occurred in 1919. And uh, a simple reason, or one of the major reasons, was the shortage of nurses. Many of the uh, uh, nurses who would ordinarily have been in the United States attending to Americans were in Europe, attending to uh, our troops uh, there abroad. There was also the shameful fact that uh, there was a shortage of, of nurses because the United States, uh, by unofficial or official policy, would not use trained African-American nurses. Mm. And so the bulk of American uh, casualties, if you would, in terms of uh, deaths mm. and, uh, and, uh, and other injuries due to, uh, due to the uh, pandemic occurred in 1919, as well as, of course, in the uh, two years prior to that. Kurt, speaking of 1919, Sports Illustrated uh, recently uncovered this um, very interesting and remarkable photo. It was from a, a semi-pro baseball game, January 26th, 1919. Uh, the Spanish flu, still a concern around the world, still a concern in America. So these two semi-pro teams are playing against each other. There um, was a major league player, Fred McMullen, who would later that year become involved in the Black Sox scandal. He actually played in this exhibition game. And in Pasadena, there was a local law adopted that said if you were out in public, you had to wear a mask. And that applied to players, umpires, fans. I'm in this photo here, it's striking. Yes, it certainly seems to be. Is that McMullen there or someone else? I don't know who the player is. It's, he's not identified. I, I think McMullen was a right-hand batter, so I don't uh -huh. know who him. Uh, well, I don't unless, know who the player is. Unless the photo is flopped, then we know it's not McMullen. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, so at least in this case, uh, Pasadena is noted not simply as the site of the, uh, of the Rose Parade. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, mass, it's, it's, it's interesting if you, uh, if you look at uh, different articles about the uh, pandemic. Of, uh, of 1918 and 1919, uh, many of the uh, of the same artifacts that, uh, that we see used now were used then. The masks, of course, and uh, many of the uh, of the uh, first responders that are helping now, from from policemen to nurses uh, to uh, uh, folks driving uh, uh, cabs and and, uh, and other vehicles. Uh, to help with uh, to help uh, stem to help stem injuries uh, 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 are present now, and so I think that the, the only difference as I see it between now and then is the lack of the media. 
a media to, uh, to stem, um, well, some would say uh, a visibility, others would say a hysteria regarding the, uh, uh, the Conan uh, coronavirus that we have today. Uh, there was no, there was no social media then. There was no uh, television, obviously. Then there was no radio then. Uh, KDKA in Pittsburgh was the first um, radio station to debut in any form, and uh, they went on the air on uh, election on election night uh, of uh, 1920. Um, Harding won, but Franklin Roosevelt was the Democratic uh, candidate for vice president. He lost, but he was uh, he would make a comeback. Uh, of sorts by winning uh, four straight terms later on as president. So we didn't have radio, we didn't have television of any kind. Uh, we had newspapers, people read more, they were educated, uh, not maybe in a formal way, but they knew more, I think, about, about uh, current affairs. And uh, I think that they, they reacted perhaps uh, to a lockdown. There were lockdowns then, but I think that they reacted perhaps in a, in a way uh, that, uh, that was uh, uh, a bit more, not stable, but I think that they were a bit more mature in mm -hmm. terms of the long slog ahead. Carl, let's talk about what might happen with baseball. Uh, there's been some talk in recent weeks about possibly conducting an entire shortened season in Arizona, uh, having all the teams, all 30 congregate there. There's been some talk about having half the teams in Arizona half the teams may be at spring training sites in Florida, trying to isolate the players, play in front of empty stadiums, no fans. Um, kind of a two-part question here. First of all, yeah. what would you do if you were um, asked to advise on this situation in terms of trying to resume a season? And then part B, what do you ultimately think is going to happen? What's your hunch? What's going to happen? You're asking me to think, like the owners and the commissioner of baseball. That for me is impossible. I cannot do so. I do not wish to do so. Um, what do I think should happen? I think you're talking here about a, 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 a panoply uh, of, of, of terrible options for baseball. Baseball has had strikes in the past that have uh, resulted from uh, from bad faith or bad judgment on behalf of the, uh, of the owners and or the players. There was enough blame to go around. This is a crisis that, that baseball, like all of us, have, uh, have, have been a victim of. Uh, we didn't ask for this, uh, by and large. Uh, we didn't cause this. We know who caused it. Uh, it was the People's Republic of China. I think all of the, uh, all of the uh, 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 evidence uh, underscores that fact, but we're paying the price. What do we do now? How can we salvage something out of a very bad situation? Uh, I don't know. Uh, the idea of playing uh, in spring training parks appeals to me because players would be close to fans, except that we don't have fans. And I don't believe without fans that, that you really have baseball, not as we, not as we approach it, uh, not as we understand it. Um, because you're talking, I mean, the I, fan comes from fandom. Fan comes from fanatic. It comes from people becoming engaged. It comes from an intimacy. It comes from that marvelous back and forth. Uh, uh, the feeling of, of, uh, of um, that you get when, when, you're, when you're growing up and you become attached to a player, it might be Bobby Richardson in my case, or Ted Williams, uh, the splendid splinter, uh, or, or Bob Feller, or it might be a more recent vintage, uh, um, you know, someone from the 2004 Red Sox, or, or the Yankee teams that have so spectacularly failed to win the World Series. I'm sorry, God will get me for that. Uh, <laughs> as was often said in the television series, Maud. But the point is, you care. You care deeply about it. There is no one in games without a fan to care deeply about it. Uh, yes, you can watch on television. I suppose you can listen on radio. But that distance is a distance, um, uh, a crowd too far. Mm. Or here, the lack of a crowd too far. 
I simply don't think it would work. And I think far worse than not having baseball this year is having baseball in which the prevailing uh, attribute is empathy, or racker, I should say, is apathy, disinterest, and crowds and, and stadiums uh, full of no one, uh, exhibiting nothing uh, except silence. In this case, the sound of silence is a sound baseball does not need. Uh, I don't know what they will do, but it seems to me that someone should make that fact because I think, I think that, that, that baseball is not taking into consideration the stunning lack of, of human interest and appeal, uh, the human condition that is at the very heart of the national game. That will be absent almost totally if baseball continues through on this crusade to have games without human beings there to watch them for the rest of the season. That's my perspective. That's my view. Yeah. Every baseball fan has a view, but that's the point. They have a view. They can express it. They won't be there to express it if this follows through. So we have precedents set during World War I, but also World War II as well. And that played out quite a bit differently. The United States enters the war, 1941. Commissioner of Baseball, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, becomes concerned. A number of the top players are uh, recruited to serve in the military. Um, minor League Baseball is gutted. Major League Baseball, certainly the quality of play um, is going to be tapped very severely. So Landis, not exactly sure what to do, looking for some counsel, some guidance, sends a letter to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And then on January 15th, 1942, FDR produces this response, the famous green light letter. Kurt, for those not that familiar with the letter, give us a summary of what essentially FDR told the commissioner here. Well, this too is the culmination of baseball uh, not having uh, clear leadership at the top. But here, no one can judge and no one can blame baseball, rather, for not having clear leadership at the top. This is in the, uh, the afterglow of Pearl Harbor. On, on, on December 7th, 1941, uh, and what uh, FDR said uh, was a date that will uh, live forever. Um, the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor, killing 2,403 Americans. Um, the day afterward, FDR had declared war, asked Congress rather to declare war, which of course it had on the empire of Japan. Baseball was then faced with the, with the uh, uh, conundrum of what to do with the 1942 uh, 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 regular season. Uh, its owners knew that its players would be drafted and would enlist and would want to fight the Japanese in the Pacific theater and the Germans and the Italians in the European theater because Hitler and Mussolini and immediately in the wake of the Japanese invasion, declared war on us. So we were fighting a two-front war. Any decent American would wish to fight. And so um, baseball decided, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, uh, I would say arguably Amer uh, baseball's greatest commissioner ever, um, who hated Roosevelt, and Roosevelt incidentally hated him. Hmm. So how to bring about an armistice between the two so that they together could involve baseball, which was then not simply the great American game, it was judged the only game. Uh, it was synonymous with, 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 with the country. It was basically a mirror image of the Republic. And so uh, Franklin Roosevelt's chief aide in this case, uh, Robert Hannigan, who was a, um, a part owner at one point of the St. Louis Cardinals, 
worked with baseball. And baseball's chief lobbyist, Clark Griffith, worked with Roosevelt's aide to draft a, a, an exchange of letters. Uh, a letter was written in, uh, in the commissioner's uh, name to uh, Roosevelt asking for his advice, saying, Mr. President, we simply don't know what to do. Please tell us. The, 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 uh, the language of Kennesaw Mountain Landis is uh, um, um, simply beseeching, is quite striking from a man who really didn't like Roosevelt at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, as I said, hated him. But the very next day, Roosevelt answers. This shows the, the extraordinary mountaintop status of baseball in 1942. Roosevelt gets the letter from Landis on January 14th. The very next day, he answers the letter with this, the green light letter. Moreover, he reads this letter aloud in a White House news conference. Hmm. My dear judge, and he reads the letter to Landis. And what he says to Landis is this, I think it would be in the best interest of the country if baseball goes forward, plays its regular season. In fact, I think it best if you have more night games because people working the day shift will then be able to look at baseball and this will be sort of a panacea. It will be, it will be something that they can look forward to as they work the day shift. Uh, uh, building planes and other armaments, which we will need to win the final victory. And then he says, in essence, uh, I'm sure you would agree with me, my dear judge, that those uh, athletes that are in uh, physical condition well enough to serve should uh, wear the, uh, the uh, uh, uniform of the United States. And almost 250 did. Ted Williams did. Joe DiMaggio did. Johnny Pesky did, Buell Blackwell did. As I said, more than 250 American baseball players went abroad and they were as big a heroes as we had during the war. And so um, Roosevelt could not have waved during the entire war a more baseball friendly uh, flag. And it was at this time, as I've said, that there really developed a special relationship between baseball and and uh, the presidency, which almost rivals the special relationship, not to put it in regal terms, but between America and Great Britain. Mm -hmm. And really that's remained ever since, uh, uh, depending upon the president. And so, uh, as I said, Roosevelt, uh, 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 you know, made, made it clear that baseball was, uh, um, in the Latin term, intermira uh, pares, uh, first among equals. I know that phrase because my mother was a former Latin uh, teacher. It's the only Latin phrase I know. But there were other uh, sports that came to him and wanted a similar blessing. Uh, horse racing came to him. It was very big then. Boxing did. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, uh, golf came to him. Uh, football came to him. And he said, no. On, to each of those uh, sports, he either answered them with a letter which said no, or he ignored them. That was the importance of the green light letter. He died in 1945, and of course, I've made the suggestion, which sadly I think has been ignored till now, that Franklin Roosevelt's blessing was so great that he should become a member of the National Baseball Hall of Fame simply because of this. We know that baseball survived in large part because of Roosevelt. We don't know, but we can suspect that, that baseball might not have survived had Roosevelt not interceded. That's not simply my view. That's the view of many players and many owners and many executives in baseball itself. In sending this letter and essentially reading it out loud, he doesn't come out and make it a, an order. It's not a declaration, but I guess if you read between the lines, it was a pretty strong suggestion that this was what he wanted. I think it is, and more to the point, this must be, this must be read in conjunction with um, the letter that had been sent before by the person who really, as I said, loathed him, and that was uh, Landis. 
Landis is, is humbling himself to beseech Roosevelt, saying, tell us what to do and we will follow you. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a stunning um, diminution of his ego, if you would. But he was put, Landis was putting baseball first, just as Roosevelt was putting his nation first when he wrote this letter. Yeah. Now the war persists through 1945 and yet no interruption to baseball for any of those seasons. That's right. That's right. There was only one cause. The cause was winning the war. That's all that meant anything. If you go back, it's one of the reasons that just as in Britain, 1940, 41, uh, are the two years that are the touchstone for the character of Great Britain. 1941, 42 through 1945 to me. And I think to so many people, to so many of the people listening today uh, as participants, and really to, as what Tom Brokaw called the greatest generation. World War II was the touchstone for the best of this country, for people pitching in, for, for sublimating perhaps what was best for them. But, what for, but for focusing upon what was best for the United States of America. And if we could do more of that and less of what was best for ourselves, we all would win. And so would the United States. And, you know, if that's not a lesson for each one of us, I don't know what is. We are speaking with a uh, baseball writer and historian, also presidential and political historian, Kurt Smith. Uh, we've talked about some of the precedents to what's going on currently with the cor uh, coronavirus situation, how it's affecting baseball, and, and how other real-world events um, have affected baseball, the Spanish flu, World War I, World War II. Um, we do want to make a, a transition to some other topics as well. And Kurt, earlier this month, um, we received the sad news, heard the sad news that uh, Al Kaline, one of our beloved Hall of Famers, uh, passed away. Um, born 1934, was a star for the Detroit Tigers uh, from the middle 50s through the middle 1970s. Here we see him, his final Topps baseball card, 1974. I never had the privilege of interviewing Al, unfortunately, but you had a chance to meet him, and that meeting, I guess, was arranged by Another pretty important baseball icon. The icon, the other icon was uh, Ernie Harwell, mm. uh, the longtime voice of the uh, Detroit Tigers. And really when you think of, of the word class uh, and you talk to any Tiger fan, those would be the two names I think that, that most likely would, would immediately uh, and uh, straight away uh, uh, spring the thought. Um, mm. Ernie Harwell was, uh, um, was one of the great voices of, uh, of any team and one of the great inductees of the, uh, of the Frick Award for the National uh, Baseball Hall of Fame. And Al Kaline was one of the greatest outfielders in baseball history. Um, yes, he was a fine hitter, 399 home runs, as I recall, certainly with, with a greater than 300 average, could hit for power. Uh, but as he himself said, uh, he was a much better outfielder even than he was a hitter, which is saying a great deal indeed. Uh, he owned the outfield at Tiger Stadium. And the outfield at Tiger Stadium had, had more turf to it than, than just about any ballpark in the bigs, with the possible exception, surely, of the polo grounds. Uh, I hope I'm not missing too many ballparks when I say that. Um, but number six... Um, uh, was first of all a teammate and, and uh, always put a team above himself. Uh, you need, you need a, a, a runner sacrificed long, he could do it for you. And you need a, you need a double to, to score a guy from first, he could do it for you. If you needed a home run, he could do it. Uh, and the, uh, Detroit had relatively short foul lines, although for, uh, center field was 440 feet away. Yeah. Um, and of course you had that famous overhang in right field where the upper deck was 25 feet closer than the lower deck. But boy, could he play right field. And this is what he's known for. I asked Ernie once, Ernie Harwell once, what was, what, what was the one reverie, the one image, mental picture that he would take with him uh, when he retired? 
if he retired. And then I said, you're not allowed to retire. But uh, expecting that he might say a home run or, or something else. And he said, no. He said, it was K-Line. K-Line going into the right field corner at Tiger Stadium, picking the ball up off the wall, turning, whirling, firing the ball to second base, nipping the runner on one hop. He said, that's Al K-Line. And that was. He was the quintessential player, the quintessential pro, never bragged on himself, ever, understated it at all, uh, which, which contributed to the love uh, that Tiger fans had for him. And incidentally, as I see players, uh, you know, go from one club to the other in free agency so they can get uh, uh, a new contract for $328 million instead of $325 million and go to another club for the same reason. Do they realize, do they stop to think for a minute how they're cheapening themselves and how they'll never be remembered in the same class as Al Kaline who played for one team, or Ted Williams for one team, or Yastrzemski for one team, or Ripken for one team. One team players have a certain cachet and a certain nobility to them. And boy, when you, when you think of baseball nobility, K-Line is right at the top. What was that meeting with him like? It was wonderful. Uh, you know, he just, uh, uh, Ernie had arranged the, the interview and I just met with him and, and uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, it was, uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, work a day for K-Line, but it was special for me. And uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, uh, marvelous. He was, uh, he was from Baltimore, of course, and he was from a working class background and uh, he'd had to work his way up. And I think he, he understood that in, in, in meeting with people. And, uh, and uh, he took a certain, he, I think he certain, he, he took a certain pride in, in, in meeting the kind of people uh, and that, it, it, that more or less come up as he had. And, and I think this is one of the reasons there were so many like him that had come up as he had. And uh, it was just great. You know, everyone has a second team. And as I mentioned, I'm a Red Sox fan. But my second team was the Tigers. And there were many years, too many even to remember, where the Red Sox were out of contention, not by Labor Day, but by Memorial Day. So after that, I would start rooting for the Tigers. And I think that that was true for a lot of people. Detroit was a great franchise and still is. But one of the reasons was Tiger Stadium and that green fortress, and as Ernie say, with the ballpark uh, at the, the corner of, uh, of, uh, of the two uh, streets. And, uh, uh, you know, he, he would make it so, uh, so visionary. And then he would go there and he would realize just what a wonderful park it was. And there in right field was number six. And um, they may not make them like that anymore, but if they do, I would like to be another one just like that. Those Tiger teams of the late 60s and the early 70s were so much fun to watch. K-Line, Norm Cash, uh, Willie Horton, Denny McClain, Mickey Lolich, John Hiller in the bullpen. Um, I was not really a Tiger fan per se, but um, I guess in some ways they were kind of my second team after the Yankees. I think so. I think if you love baseball and love, and love class, you had to love K-Line. It's the same reason that, you know, the Red Sox-Yankees – uh, a rivalry and, and 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 people Red Sox fans oh I hate the Yankees or Yankee fans oh I hate the I hate the Red Sox they're really not baseball fans because if you're a Yankee fan how can you not uh, admire what Ted Williams was the greatest hitter who ever lived or Fenway Park in many ways the most intimate ballpark ever with the possible exception of Ebbets Field and if you're a Red Sox fan how can you not admire the New York Yankees the Yankees mean baseball all around the world. I know it hurts, it hurts me to say so, but it's true. And if you're a baseball fan, baseball eclipses your team. And that was true with Kaline, and it still is. A couple of other topics to talk about, and I want to center in on your most recent book, which came out two years ago. You participated in our author series at the Hall of Fame. Always fun to uh, have authors come in during the course of the spring and the summer. The Presidents in the Pastime, the History of Baseball and the White House. Tell us first about the cover of this book, how you came up with that. Well, how could I not? 
uh, at least in my view, uh, Roosevelt is on the cover, but he forms the spine of the book for the reasons that we just uh, spoke about. Uh, World War II. Uh, without him, there, be, there may not be a baseball post-World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, his story is so, is so personally inspiring. He had been a baseball fan. He had been the team manager at, uh, at uh, Groton Academy. Uh, and he was a baseball fan. Uh, maybe not knowing the intricacies of the game as other presidents have, at least a couple of them, but he loved it. He said, I'm a baseball fan. He said, I love, I'm, I'm the kind of fan that loves the greatest action. Give me the greatest score and I'm the most happiest. He said, um, uh, not necessarily even balls going into the stands, meaning a home run. But he said, a ball hit between the outfielders going to the wall and the fielders, uh, going for the ball and the shortstop going for the relay and, and, uh, and uh, players uh, and, and, and the runners are going around the bases. Well, isn't that what the ordinary baseball fan likes? I do. And uh, I think most people do. Maybe, maybe the purists, and I say that word with some affection, some uh, likes one and nothing again. Maybe, maybe people that like statistics, he used to call them statics and hated them. Uh, you know, likes to uh, debate for 19 hours about uh, about uh, uh, players that played uh, 120 years ago. But the average fan, the the the, the fan that truly really forms his heart and soul, loves that kind of game. And and Roosevelt was that kind of fan. So he belonged on the cover. And uh, there were other opening there were some day people who wanted president or two. Pardon me. Kurt, is this from an opening day, um, uh, throwing out the first pitch, or from a World Series game? That is opening day of 1933. And uh, uh, Clark Griffith is beating. Joe Cronin is on the right. And then you've got some uh, military brass as well. Joe Cronin, Hall of Famer. Um, yes. Who was he playing for at the time? What, was it Washington? Uh, I believe it was for the Senators, and, and I believe he was the Senators manager at the time. Okay. And, of course, later would become American League president as well. Precisely. In the middle is Clark Griffith, the owner. Yes, that's right. Clark Griffith was the uh, embodiment of the Washington Senators, or as the Nationals, they were called both for many years. Yeah. And Roosevelt loved it. He threw the game, he threw the opening ball out at least eight times. He had this unorthodox uh, overhand lob that he, uh, that he would throw. Uh, you know, he, he, he of course contracted the polio at age 39 and uh, never walked another day in his life. Although to the last day of his life, he was trying to, uh, to walk. He showed enormous courage, mm -hmm. uh, but he was, he loved opening day, just loved it. Loved the whole ritual of baseball. Loved being around people, and uh, loved the uh, loved the uh, action of the game. And as I said, knew knew a lot of the. Uh, he, he might not have known these statistics, but he knew he knew the uh, uh, the rituals of the game. In a few moments, we're going to take your questions in our chat room. And if you'd like to put your questions in there, you can type them in, and uh, we'll uh, try to get to as many of those as we can. Questions for Kurt Smith. Kurt, I have two more questions uh, for you before we go to our chat room. Uh, first of all, with regard to the presidency, um, which president do you feel the biggest baseball fan? Um, I have a feeling it may have been the man that you worked for. Is that the case? Well, I don't want to uh, disqualify Democratic presidents because uh, John F. Kennedy loved the Red Sox. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Clinton grew up on, Bill, on, uh, on listening to uh, Harry Carey on KMOX radio in, uh, in Arkansas as part of the Cardinal Network when he was a kid. But I think the two uh, that I would suggest, one was uh, uh, certified by baseball. He was Richard Nixon. Mm. He grew up as a kid literally obsessed by baseball. Uh, he uh, was on Bob Wolf's uh, radio show for the Senators when he was Eisenhower's vice president in the 1950s. Uh, in the 1960s, in 1965, in between being vice president for Eisenhower and winning the presidency in 69, he was offered the commissionership of baseball in 1965. But as Nixon said, I didn't tell them this 
but I had other plans, his other plans, meaning the presidency. In 1969, he threw the greatest party ever, I think it's fair to say, for baseball. And that was in Washington at the White House uh, to commemorate baseball's 100th anniversary. And then in 1972 and also 1992, uh, at the request of Associated Press, he chose his all-time baseball team. And his all-time uh, baseball manager was Casey Stengel, hmm. and, uh, who was a Democrat. And Nixon and he were once talking for two hours in a bar about baseball, and, and Stengel had to leave, and he said, I had to get out of there before that boy made me a Republican. And in 1992, Nixon chose, as I said, Stengel for his all-time manager. And Stengel, and, uh, and Nixon said of Stengel, the essence of diplomacy is to, is to confuse the opposition. The opposition never knew what Casey was talking about. Casey always knew. If I had it to do over again, I'd name Casey Secretary of State. Well, the thought, the very thought still staggers, but that was Richard Nixon in baseball. The other was George Herbert Walker Bush, my former boss, who loved baseball, who lived it, who picked up a bat at age five and said, baseball has everything. And that's what he thought all during his life. He coached the game. He played the game. He was the captain of his team at, uh, at uh, Yale University. His hero was, was uh, Lou Gehrig, a fellow first baseman. A longtime friend was Ted Williams. He met him in the war. Uh, the war in which Bush in 1944 nearly lost his life when his plane was shot down by the Japanese. Mm. Uh, and then during the presidency himself, he had, he had DiMaggio, Joe DiMaggio, and, and uh, Williams to the White House in 1991 to give them the President's Award, an award that had never been given and hasn't been given since. I had to write the text for the President's Award. I asked John Sununu, Chief of Staff, what this war is about. He said, it's never been given before and never been given since. Bush just wants to do it. <laughs> so he did. And Bush, DiMaggio, and Williams in the Rose Garden, I'll tell you, it was like, uh, it was like parishioners waiting to greet the Pope. Uh, Williams, to no one's surprise, dominated the event. He didn't mean to. He said the fewest words, but his presence was just astonishing. And then Bush put them on Air Force One and went to a summit in Toronto he had conveniently scheduled for the same day of the All-Star Game. So the three of them told baseball stories uh, on the way up to the All-Star Game. Bush had done this so he could listen to the kid and to, uh, and to Joe D tell baseball stories on, on Air Force One for an hour and a half. That was George Bush and baseball. So both Bush and Nixon, tremendous fans of the game. I'll put you on the spot. Who do you think knew the game better? Oh, I, I can't answer. Okay. I mean, Nixon watched the game. Bush played the game. But they both knew the game. I can't answer. Fair enough. It's a tie. <laughs> All right. We'll take some questions in our chat room. Uh, you can type the question out. Uh, tell us where you're from. And... Uh, we're going to go to Merle, who's been uh, watching a number of our programs. Merle wants to know, who was the first president that started to invite teams that won the World Series, the Super Bowl, et cetera, to the White House? Do you know who the first one was, Kurt? Well, I'm tempted to say for the World Series, I'm going to say Ronald Reagan. Okay. I'm going to say uh, all of them. Uh, yes, Reagan began that tradition. Um, Nixon had, had, had talked to teams by telephone to a number of them, but Ronald Reagan began that. Uh, uh, it was a way, I'll tell you, he invited uh, the World Series team to the White House as a way in the 1980s to keep baseball interest alive in Washington. When the, when, after the uh, Rangers had been kidnapped and gone to Texas, and I, for all intents and purposes, the Orioles had become Washington's team. We have a question from Brody. Brody would like to know, Kurt, who is your favorite player of all time? Oh, good question. Well, Bobby Richardson of the Yankees was when I was a kid. 
My father's pl uh, favorite player was Ted Williams. Um, I'm going to say Williams. Yeah. I think I have a little company in that choice. Sure. <laughs> and did you ever interview Ted? Did I interview uh, Ted? I did not interview him, but I met him, of course, and spent a little time uh, the day at the White House in, uh, in uh, 1991. Nice. A uh, question from Ryan Witcher, and this actually, I guess, is from me. How did you find the picture of baseball players wearing masks in 1919? Well, we have to give credit to Sports Illustrated. They That's ran an article a few weeks ago uh, about that photograph, uh, tying it into the current health situation. And then one of our curators, Tom Schieber, did some research for us, and we posted about that picture, that game, uh, Pasadena, January of 1919, we were able to post about it on our education Facebook page, thanks to Tom's research. Yeah, Bruce, uh, Bruce we have a question from Richard Diliberto. Uh, has any president other than President Obama ever spoken at the Hall of Fame? Um, I think I might be able to answer that question. Yeah. Kurt can correct me. Um, I don't think a sitting president other than President Obama has ever spoken. We did have. Uh, George Bush, the younger, uh, he visited before he became president. Right. And I believe George Bush, the elder, came to Cooperstown after he was president. Am that's I right. Yeah, that's right. Bush came, uh, the elder, in 1987. Let, may I say something before, uh, before a time runs out on me? Uh, I say this around the country, so this is not simply because this uh, 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 dialogue in this program is being sponsored by the Hall of Fame. The staff at the Hall of Fame, the research staff, the audio visual staff, the photography staff, everyone who works staff, you are listening to the best staff of any Hall of Fame, of any presidential library in the country. I have dealt with all of the staffs for the, uh, for the major sports and all of the presidential uh, libraries. And all of them are, are, are first rate. They're first rate because people are working for them because they have an interest in the subject. Mm -hmm. It's not work for them, it's a, it's a love. But the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown is special because baseball is special. I have been to Cooperstown since I was 10 years old. It was my first trip uh, from a little town outside of Rochester, uh, Caledonia, three and a half hours away from, from Cooperstown. I have been to Cooperstown to the Hall of Fame probably uh, 70 to 75 times since then, mostly on research, some to speak, and never have I been disappointed. Uh, and, I, and I speak for other people because I've talked to them and they echo this. The attention to the detail, the kindness, the loyalty, the love of baseball is simply unparalleled. And I wanted to say that before I forgot because it is so true. And, and I hope it's said by other people, and I believe it is. Well, we appreciate that very much, Kurt. It's very kind of you. Um, I know one year you did the uh, keynote address at the symposium uh, right. that we um, usually have in late May. We had to cancel this year because of what's been going on. Right. Uh, I know that you've worked with Jim Gates, our librarian, on that. Uh, John Horn in our photograph department uh, is another person that uh, helps us out a lot. Uh, uh, in our department in education, Stephanie Hazard, uh, just a few of the people, also uh, our IT guru, um, uh, Tiny Singh, who recently joined us from the uh, Angels organization, um, has also been helping us with the technical side of things uh, in, doing, uh, in doing these uh, programs. Um, Kurt, we have just a couple of minutes left. Um, you expressed earlier your your thoughts on a baseball season? You'd rather see if they do resume baseball, you'd rather see it in its, in its actual form with fans as opposed to empty uh, ballparks. Um, nobody at this point really knows for sure what's going to happen, but we'll, we'll see in the coming weeks and months. Um, but for you personally, what, um, what are you doing? How are you occupying your time? Uh, any plans for another book? Oh, yes. Um... I talk to any writer and they're always preoccupied with what's next. Um, yeah, there are several books, none of which I'm going to mention now <laughs> in case they don't happen. But uh, 
you know, they're, they're, uh, one is involved with baseball, the other uh, is involved with, with uh, politics. Not, not surprisingly, they're two of the few, two of the few arenas uh, uh, I know even a little bit about. But uh, uh, you know, writers, writers are here to write, and uh, that's, that's what we attempt to do. And you're continuing to do lectures for the University of Yeah, I'm, I'm full time at the University of Rochester as long as uh, you know I, I love it. Uh, you know, if I can, if I can, uh, if I can uh, even be adequate at Zoom, I suppose I can do anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Given my lack of technological uh, assets, thank goodness. I my wife Sarah is uh, magnificent at that, so mm -hmm. she has been uh, uh, you know the uh, the stagecoach driver of our. Uh, of our uh, Zoom broadcast to my patient students, but uh, hopefully that will be uh, that will be past history by this fall. And I love uh, I love teaching students, particularly uh, the history of the presidency and, of course, the art of public speaking. Well, we thank Sarah and we thank you as well, Kurt Smith, joining us this past hour uh, for this program. Uh, next week, the second in our series of Virtual Voices of the Game will be. A uh, longtime baseball writer, Jason Stark, another friend of the Hall of Fame. Kurt, we've covered a lot of topics. Uh, as always, it's terrific to uh, to talk to you, to see you. Um, always welcome in Cooperstown. We hope uh, we, we hope we'll see you in the village, in the museum, in the near future. Well, I'll be there. I appreciate it, and all of uh, the participants uh, uh, this morning as well. Thank you so much. All right, great. Thank you, Kurt. Appreciate your time. We thank all our listeners and viewers as well. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the first in our series of virtual voices of the game from the Hall of Fame's education department. Thank you for being with us today. Have a great day, everybody. Excellent, Kurt. Thank you. Was I okay?